From New York, this is Democracy Now! Under the it's giving them a false sense right of security. Now, I think it's under control. I'll tell you what. How? A thousand Americans are dying a day. They are dying. That's true. And you ha it is what it is. As the U.S. coronavirus death toll tops 156,000, a stunning new expose in Vanity Fair reveals a White House task force led by Jared Kushner abandoned a nationwide coronavirus testing plan in the spring because they thought the pandemic would only hit Democratic states. We'll speak to reporter Catherine Eban. Then we look at why immigration lawyers got arrested outside the home of the California governor, demanding the release of jailed asylum seekers and immigrants during the pandemic. We're here today, not just to ask, but to demand yeah. that Gavin Newsom live up to the values he says he holds yeah. and free them all. Free them all. We'll speak with one of the arrested attorneys who himself is undocumented and with an asylum seeker who led a hunger strike while he was held in a nice jail. Then we look at the Border Patrol's militarized raid on a humanitarian camp set up by the group No More Deaths near the Mexican border in Arizona. It's the same type of special operations team recently deployed against protesters on the streets of Portland. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The U.S. death toll from COVID-19 has topped 156,000, by far the highest in the world. On Monday, President Trump lashed out at his top White House coronavirus adviser, Dr. Deborah Birx, after she warned the virus is, quote, extraordinarily widespread. Trump took to Twitter, calling Birx pathetic. Meanwhile, concern is growing the Trump administration may rush to approve a vaccine to boost the president's chances of winning in November. The New York Times revealed the Department of Health and Human Services produced a slideshow for the White House in April about developing a vaccine. The first slide read, quote, deadline, enable broad access to the public by October 2020. The date was in bold letters. One regular participant in White House meetings on vaccine development has been Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, who's also helping to run his reelection campaign. We'll have more on that story after headlines. The World Health Organization is warning there may never be a silver bullet to defeat the coronavirus. There is no silver bullet at the moment, and there might never be. For now, stopping outbreaks comes down to the basics of public health and disease control, testing, isolating, and treating patients and tracing and quarantining their contacts. Global death toll approaches 700,000, though the true number is believed to be far higher. The BBC is reporting leaked records from the Iranian government show almost 42,000 Iranians have died from the virus, nearly triple the number reported by the health ministry. In Latin America, the total number of cases has now topped 5 million, with more than 200,000 deaths. Brazil's recorded almost 95,000 coronavirus deaths, the world's second highest total, Mexico's third highest, with 48,000. Deaths. On Monday, the Brazilian president, Jair Bolsonaro's chief of staff, tested positive for the virus, making him the seventh Brazilian minister to have contracted the infection. President Trump has threatened to sue Nevada over its expansion of mail-in voting. Democratic Governor Steve Sislak signed a bill Monday ensuring all registered voters automatically receive a mail-in ballot. Trump tweeted, quote, Nevada's clubhouse governor made it impossible for Republicans to win the state. Trump made a similar claim in March, saying if Democrats had expanded voter access in the coronavirus relief bill, quote, you'd never have a Republican elected in this country again. Trump also renewed his attack on the U.S. Postal Service, saying it would not be able to handle the increase in mail. The USPS responded in a statement that they have ample capacity to handle the higher volume. In other election news, five states are holding primaries today—Michigan, Missouri, Kansas, Arizona and Washington. 
A warning to our audience, the next three stories contain graphic footage of police violence. A leaked police body cam video reveals George Floyd begged Minneapolis police officers not to shoot him just minutes before an officer killed him by kneeling on his neck for over eight minutes, as two other officers also held him down. In the video, Floyd is seen sitting in his car saying, please don't shoot me, I just lost my mom. Step on the face away. Okay, father, please don't shoot me, please, man. I'm not gonna shoot please. you. Step on the face no, away. I'm gonna get out of here, man. Please don't shoot me, man. Please, man. I just lost my mom, man. Step on the face away. Step on and face. Another part of the video shows George Floyd handcuffed, saying, I'm not resisting. Van Crump, an attorney for the Floyd family, said Monday, the police officers approached him with guns drawn simply because he was a black man. As this video shows, he never posed any threat, Crump said. Newly released police body cam footage reveals Los Angeles police shot a protester in the head with a so-called less lethal round, while the man had his arms in the air during a protest May 3rd. The protester, C.J. Montano, is a 24-year-old former Marine who was protesting the killing of George Floyd. Montano was hospitalized for four days. He's still recovering. Montano's attorney condemned the police department's use of force, saying, quote, he's isolated in that intersection. His arms are up in the air. There's no good argument that he was hit accidentally, unquote. The Los Angeles Police Department has described the incident as a, quote, unintentional hit. Head strike. In Conway, Arkansas, prosecutors have just cleared several officers of criminal charges over their violent arrest in February of a man who died after he was repeatedly punched in the back, tasered while on the ground, and pinned under an officer's knee as he protested, I can't breathe. The officer replied, if you can talk, you can breathe, chill out. Newly released police body cam footage shows officers pressing 39-year-old Lionel Morris into the floor of a supermarket for six and a half minutes, ignoring his repeated cries for medical help. Morris became unresponsive, was later pronounced dead on the way to the hospital. Police were called when Morris allegedly attempted to shoplift. The officers have been placed on paid administrative leave pending an internal investigation. The Census Bureau has announced it'll wrap up collection efforts for the 2020 census a month earlier than planned, even though the pandemic has disrupted field operations. All door knocking and phone inquiries will now end September 30th. Kristen Clark of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law condemned the decision, saying, quote, by prematurely ending critical door knocking efforts, we run the risk of missing millions in black and immigrant communities. This decision may deprive these communities of fair representation and fair allocation of funds for the next 10 years, she said. A 33-year-old Mexican man died over the weekend, days after he fell from the U.S.-Mexico border wall in Arizona. Customs and Border Protection, who found and detained the unidentified man, said he was brought to a medical center but eventually succumbed to his injuries. In the Mexican state of Guerrero, gunmen shot dead journalist Pato Madrugueres on Sunday, along with his bodyguard. Madugares worked for the news website PM Noticias and had recently reported on a crime that involved local criminal gangs. According to Reporters Without Borders, he's at least the fourth journalist killed in Mexico this year. In El Salvador, a judge sentenced three police officers to 20 years each for the 2019 killing of 29-year-old Camila Diaz Cordova, a transgender woman. Prosecutors say the officers brutally assaulted her, then threw her out of a moving vehicle. Diaz Cordova has been deported from the United States a year before she was killed. The case marks the first homicide conviction for a killing of a transgender person in El Salvador. In Egypt, human rights advocates are condemning the conviction and prison sentences handed last week to young women over their TikTok videos, which were found to violate so-called family values and public morals. The convictions have also intensified public attention on the case of 17-year-old Mena Abdelaziz, who in May posted a social media video in which she appeared covered in bruises and revealed she was gang 
raped. The teenager was then arrested alongside the accused men and accused of inciting debauchery and violating family values. In other news from Egypt, over 200 public figures from around the world, including actors and writers, as well as rights groups and cultural organizations, have signed on to a letter calling for the release of political prisoner Sana Saif and, quote, all those detained for peacefully exercising their rights. The 26-year-old activist and film editor was arrested last month. To see our interview with Sana Saif's mother, activist Leila Saif, go to democracynow.org. In Spain, the royal family is refusing to disclose the whereabouts of former King Juan Carlos after it was announced Monday he's going into exile in the wake of a corruption scandal that has rocked the monarchy in recent months. In June, the Spanish Supreme Court launched a probe into Juan Carlos's involvement with a Saudi rail contract after a Swiss newspaper reported he received $100 million from the late Saudi Arabian king, Abdullah. Juan Carlos abdicated as king in 2014, after another corruption investigation drew scrutiny to the royal family's finances. He's the father of the sitting king, Felipe, who has distanced himself from Juan Carlos, including renouncing his inheritance in March as the scandal erupted. Poland's defense ministry has reached a deal with the Trump administration to permanently station 1,000 additional U.S. troops in Poland, bringing the total U.S. contingent there to 5,500. The announcement came days after the Pentagon announced plans to withdraw some 12,000 U.S. troops from bases in Germany. Back in the United States, the Manhattan District Attorney may be investigating President Trump over bank and insurance fraud, according to a new filing from his office. DA Cyrus Vance has been looking into hush money payments made during Trump's 2000 presidential campaign to women Trump had affairs with. But Monday's filing, which seeks to compel Trump's accounting firm to hand over eight years of his tax returns, suggests the investigation is much more expansive, as it cites reports of, quote, extensive and protracted criminal conduct the Trump Organization. On Monday, Trump dismissed the news, saying it was part of a Democratic witch hunt against him. The federal judge, whose son was killed and husband critically injured after a racist, self-described anti-feminist lawyer opened fire on their house in North Brunswick, New Jersey, last month, has spoken out in a video urging more privacy protections for judges. Judge Esther Salas is the first Latina federal judge in New Jersey. The monster knew where I lived and where and what church we attended and had a complete dossier on me and my family. At the moment, there is nothing we can do to stop it, and that is unacceptable. My son's death cannot be in vain. The Food and Drug Administration has expanded its list of dangerous hand sanitizers to over 100 different products. The FDA warns some hand sanitizers contain methanol, which can be toxic when applied topically and deadly if ingested. The FDA's list also includes sanitizers that contain less than 60 percent alcohol, the amount needed to be effective. An Irish politician, John Hume, has died at the age of 83. He won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1998 for his role in crafting the Good Friday Agreement that ended decades of conflict in Northern Ireland. At the time, the Nobel Committee praised him for being, quote, the clearest and most consistent of Northern Ireland's political leaders in his work for a peaceful solution. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by my co-host Juan Gonzalez at his home in New Brunswick. New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, as the national coronavirus death toll surpasses 156,000, the highest by far in the world, the U.S. making up more than a quarter of global deaths, on Monday, President Trump attacked top White House coronavirus adviser Dr. Deborah Birx for saying that the U.S. is in a new phase as the virus spreads out of control. What we're seeing today is different from March and April. It is extraordinarily widespread. It's into the rural as equal urban areas. And to everybody who lives in a rural area, you are not immune or protected from this virus. President Trump responded Monday, tweeting, so crazy, Nancy Pelosi said horrible things about Dr. Deborah Birx going after her because she was too positive on the very good job we're doing on combating the China virus, including vaccines and therapeutics. In order to counter Nancy, Deborah took the bait and hit us. Pathetic. 
he said. Dr. Anthony Fauci defended Dr. Burt, saying community spread is insidious. Despite this, Trump told Axios's Jonathan Swan the coronavirus is under control. It's giving them a full sense right of security. Now, I think it's under control. I'll tell you what. How? A thousand Americans are dying a day. They are dying. That's true. And you ha it is what it is. But that doesn't mean we aren't doing everything we can. It's under control as much as you can control it. This is a horrible plague that beset us. You in fact, the coronavirus has spread all over the United States. More than five months into the crisis, there continued to be critical testing shortages and delays. How did we get here? We turn now to a stunning new expose in Vanity Fair that reveals how the Trump administration ended up with no national testing plan, despite a months-long effort spearheaded by Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner. In an explosive piece headlined, How Jared Kushner's Secret Testing Plan Went Poof Into Thin Air, Reporter Catherine Eban writes, Jared Kushner was pursuing a national testing plan with the help of a handful of wealthy business owners when the White House decided it was not necessary because COVID-19 had, quote, hit blue states hardest. Eban writes, quote, this summer has illustrated in devastating detail the human and economic cost of not launching a system of national testing, which most every other industrialized nation has done. Ivan writes. She joins us now from Truro, Massachusetts. She's author of Bottle of Lies, the inside story of the generic drug boom and Dangerous Doses, a true story of cops, counterfeiters and the contamination of America's drug supply. Catherine, welcome back to Democracy Now! Can you Thanks. lay out what you learned about why we are at this point in this country where people around the country are waiting hours and hours and hours for their tests, and then they wait days, if not weeks, for the results, rendering them virtually ineffective. Go back to what this White House was doing in the early months. So, starting in March, uh, it was very clear to every public health expert that we needed a nationally organized diagnostic testing plan, one that could surge supplies, uh, allocate test kits, allocate uh, precious laboratory capacity. And uh, Jared Kushner, inside the White House, gathered a group of his associates, including his college roommate, uh, some Morgan Stanley bankers. A uh, sort of brain trust. They began reaching out to billionaires who did not have public health experience per se. But then they brought in uh, a group of uh, diagnostic testing experts from the industry, working night and day in secret uh, on the encrypted WhatsApp platform. They hammered out a national testing plan that essentially resembled what every other. Uh, advanced nation has established. Um, and the participants in the plan, uh, and we obtained the plan, I should say, the participants expected that at any moment in early April, the plan would be announced. It vanished into thin air, as one participant described it. Why? And what was the reason? So, the plan at that moment hit shifting sentiment at the White House. Uh, the view at that point in early April, uh, in part led by predictions by Dr. Uh, Deborah Burks, is that the virus was on its way out. It was subsiding. There was a view that a national testing plan would be an enormous effort with a lot of political liability. But there was an additional calculation. Uh, which was expressed from one member of Kushner's team to someone that we interviewed, uh, which is that this was mostly affecting blue states. Um, and if a political argument was needed, um, they could simply blame those Democratic governors uh, for the spread. And so the national testing plan was abandoned. And on April 27th, Trump stepped to the podium in the Rose Garden and announced the uh, administration plan, which bore no resemblance to the one hammered out by the group. And this was a plan that essentially kicked the problem to the states. The states would individually be responsible for um, uh, getting test kits, getting lab capacity. Um, and that really has led to what we have seen over this terrible summer, miles long lines of cars in Texas and Arizona heat, waiting uh, 
online to get tests, people waiting seven plus days to get results, which essentially renders the tests useless. Uh, and that's where we are. You know, we cannot monitor where this virus is at point because we don't have enough testing. You cannot, uh, you cannot fight what you don't see. And that is the predicament we are currently in. And Catherine Eban, what about the reaction of the medical experts uh, in the uh, in the in the federal government to this? First of all, to the Kushner team itself, and then to the fact that the president didn't even uh, implement the, the plan of that team. Well, you know, public health experts have known all along that a national testing plan was absolutely required, but my understanding is that this Jared Kushner team did not really work. Uh, with the public health agencies. Uh, as far as I can tell from my reporting, his plan, which we obtained, never trickled down to the agencies and the decision makers within HHS uh, and other entities. Uh, now, of course, the White House has come out and denied this and denied our report. Um, but, you know, as one participant said to us, we were working in a bubble. You know, we were in a bubble, they were in a bubble, and the bubbles never overlapped. And, and what about this whole issue of kicking the testing situation down to the states? You quote a, uh, a uh, Dr. Pellini saying that the test diagnostic testing industry is a, quote, loosely constructed web, and that COVID-19 is, in essence, a stage five hurricane. How is this uh, this loosely connected web uh, going to be able to deal with the current uh, crisis that we have? It's a great question. I mean, the answer is it's not. You know, the, it, it, someone described it to me, it's like the early 20th century and the power grids, right? And every city and location had its own power grid, and you couldn't surge power from one grid to another, right? So, Quest Diagnostics lab capacity only belongs to Quest, and LabCorp's capacity only belongs to LabCorp. And Quest Diagnostics came out in July and announced that the median time to get results was seven days because they were so overrun. Now, the testing plan that was worked out by Kushner's team would have solved that problem because one of the things it called for was allowing any lab with capacity to test any sample, right? And you would have had an organized system of, of, of sending samples to labs that had capacity. You know, it's just like when you go to a supermarket, uh, or in the old days, uh, before coronavirus, when we all shopped at crowded supermarkets, and there were people who guided shoppers to checkout lines that had space. That is essentially what was required here. I mean, as one person we interviewed said, this is not rocket science. This is just like creating UPS for an industry. You know, you have to connect these dots. And that was never done. Confusing here, Catherine E. Ben, is that President Trump wants to open the economy, and he is demanding that uh, kids be able to go to school all over the country. Of course, his son, his school is not open. He doesn't talk about that very much. But in order to do those things, in order to have a rational plan where everyone doesn't come down with COVID, you need the test. So it goes against his own interests. Well, that's right. I mean, it's stunningly short-sighted. Um, so the Rockefeller Foundation, I described their effort in the piece. They saw this absolute absence of a plan. And they stepped forward with a very detailed plan, which they're now trying to implement, which would surge up testing to 30 million tests a week, which is what they say we need in order to reopen safely, right? So kids who are going to school, workers who are returning back, how do you, how do, you do any of that if you can't quickly identify who is infected? So. Without a national plan, the only thing that is left for you to do is to shut down the economy again, which is a really blunt instrument. So, you know, President Trump says he wants to reopen the economy, uh, he wants to reopen schools, but literally the only way to do that, according to the Rockefeller Foundation and other experts, 
is to have this widespread system of testing, which we currently lack. And uh, Catherine, your your piece in Vanity Fair starts out with a a delivery of a one million Chinese made diagnostic tests in March, and with a strange invoice uh, for uh, uh, three point five million tests for fifty two million dollars, and it, and uh, there's just a note that says W H. Could you talk about that? Yeah, so this is actually where my reporting for this piece began, which is I obtained this very strange invoice. It's from a company, Cogna Technology Solutions, which misspells its name on the invoice. They're a subsidiary of Group 42, which is an artificial intelligence company that has close ties to the ruling family of the United Arab Emirates. Um, the invoice is for 52 million uh, diagnostic, uh, excuse me, $52 million worth of diagnostic tests. Uh, but what was so strange about this invoice is it lists a client name, which was just two initials, WH, and that was the White House. Uh, and as I further reported it, the tests got delivered to the embassy of the United Arab Emirates. Um, so this was First, 1 million tests delivered, then 2.5 million more delivered. And when they were tested in a uh, government lab, it turned out that they were contaminated and useless. So as the FDA said to me, uh, they were shipped from the Middle East. The reagents have to be kept cold. Um, and so, you know, this was, as I understand it now, this an early effort overseen by Jared Kushner's task force to ramp up diagnostic testing. I mean, I think you'll remember, I think it was March 6th, Donald Trump goes to the CDC and he said rather infamously now, you know, the tests are beautiful. Anyone who wants a test gets a test. That was completely untrue. Um, and so behind the scenes, his son-in-law and this team are trying to ramp up diagnostic tests and access to tests, uh, but the tests that they seem to have procured uh, didn't work. Can you talk about, for example, Phoenix and what happened, uh, what the uh, mayor of Phoenix, Mayor Gallego, said, and then also talk about another country like South Korea, an example of what, what can work? Yeah. I mean, this is really um, two different universes. So in, Ar in Arizona, the mayor of Phoenix, uh, Kate Gallego, goes to FEMA uh, in April and says, we need assistance and help uh, to ramp up diagnostic testing. Uh, we need money. We need, you know, organization. And they say to her, because at this point now, the decision has been made to shift the responsibility to the say states, they say, um, well, you're not really qualified to get our assistance because your case count is low. And behind the scenes, uh, people who work for her pointed out in emails I obtained, um, the reason our case counts are low is because we don't have access to tests, right? The tests that we need would show that our case counts aren't low. That was ignored. Fast forward to June, you know, Arizona was the first state uh, the last state to close its economy and the first state to reopen with really no provisions for a phased reopening. Their case counts start skyrocketing in June. The mayor described to me she lives near one of these drive through testing sites, and literally she's seeing her neighbors waiting in miles-long lines of cars in heat over 100 degrees. People who can't breathe or struggling to breathe are waiting for tests. Uh, and when they finally are able to get tests, Gallagher's own staff had to wait two weeks to get back test results. So what that means is those tests are essentially useless, right? I mean, it's not just getting a test. It's how quickly you get back the results and what you do with those results. I so, want to turn to Jared Kushner himself, speaking right. on Fox and Friends, two days after President Trump's news conference in late April. He was asked about testing. Everyone's talking about testing, and I have to say that the work that's been done over the last 
60 days on testing has been absolutely extraordinary. We're at about 5.8 million tests now performed, by far the most in the world, and you're going to see that number continue to accelerate. We're starting another round of calls with all the governors today to ask them what additional supplies they need, what's their two-month plan, what's their six-month plan, and right now we fulfilled all the orders that the governors have. They have excess capacity in their states. Yesterday, Governor DeSantis was saying that he has more testing capacity than he has demand uh, for the tests, and so uh, we're really doing quite well with that. And I always find that we see the leading indicators, and, and often the media sees the lagging indicators, but the leading indicators are testing, are extraordinarily positive, uh, and I'm very confident that we have all the testing we need to start opening the country. So that's Jared Kushner speaking in April. Of course, Florida went into free fall after that when it came to the numbers of deaths and uh, and uh, infections. Um, so then contrast this. I mean, you have Harvard University saying there should be 20 million tests a day being done in this country to even begin to deal with this community spread throughout the country with South Korea. Yeah. So, I mean, the whole idea of preparedness is you prepare before you have a problem. Then if you don't need what you prepared for, that's wonderful. But if things get bad, you, you, you are prepared. So that's what South Korea did before they had rising case counts. They set up a whole system of not just drive-through testing sites, but walk-through testing sites. They're sort of phone booth testing sites with plexiglass barriers, and that has two effects. It um, preserves uh, PPE, protective equipment, because if staff are protected, they don't have to wear as much of it. It preserves their energy, because it's very hard to be wearing that while you're testing. So people can get tested then, they get their results back within 24 hours. So that is timely information that you can act on. Further, when they get a positive test, their contacts are traced and they're put in supportive isolation, which means food is brought to them. They're able to quarantine with support. So if you contrast that with the miles long lines of cars, you know, waiting for, for tests, it's really, Stunning. And just to say one more thing about that clip you played uh, from Jared Kushner, you know, I was struck by what he said about Texas, how, you know, there's way more supply than there is demand. I mean, they were really gambling here. You know, they were really banking on this idea that you would not have spread from blue states to red states, uh, which is an incredibly uh, dumb gamble when you consider that this was a virus that crossed oceans, uh, you know. Catherine, I wanted to ask you about the, the racial and class breakdown of even this testing crisis. I mean, we have not only people in the White House being tested almost on a daily basis, we now have the spectacle, and to me, I consider it outrageous, that Major League Baseball is testing its players constantly to make sure that the teams can stay on the field, and yet so many Americans uh, uh, don't have access, not only to uh, a, a test right away, but it's most especially, as you're mentioning, to the results. You know, you're absolutely right. I mean, they're demanding, President Trump is demanding reopenings of schools and businesses, and yet there is this incredible discrepancy. So, you know, in my reporting on the Rockefeller Foundation's plan, I, I sort of sat in on some of their deliberations. This was a huge question about school reopenings. You know, you have private schools that can afford to stand up a system of testing, they have nurses, then you have impoverished public school systems where they can't even afford a school nurse. So how are they going to manage this? You know, they're, they're not getting help with testing. They're, they don't have access to anything. Um, so there's this a remarkable discrepancy, which is at the heart of it. Yes. And finally, Catherine Ebon, um, you're the author of Bottle of Lies, the inside story of the generic drug boom. Talk about your concerns about drug shortages, regulations, quality control, um, and um, just overall in the midst of this pandemic. Yeah. So the book exposes widespread fraud in overseas manufacturing plants that make the bulk of our low-cost generics. You know, many, many people viewed with concern 
that this was a national security crisis in the making because we are dependent on Chinese uh, active ingredients, uh, finished doses from India. Once the pandemic hit, we were literally flying blind, right? The FDA can no longer go overseas to inspect those plants. Um, the FDA was also basically eroding its own safeguards by accepting uh, pharmaceutical products from plants they had never inspected. Suddenly, India is saying, you know, we're going to ban the export of 26 essential drugs, right? So we're in shortage. We need all kinds of specialized pharmaceuticals in order to ventilate patients. Um, so we've seen, you know, increased shortages. Um, so what I wrote about in that book is really coronavirus has accelerated all these issues. I want to thank you so much for being with us. Catherine Eban, investigative journalist and author. Her new report for Vanity Fair is headlined, How Jared Kushner's Secret Testing Plan Went Poof Into Thin Air. We'll link to it at democracynow.org. She's also author of Bottle of Lies, the inside story of the generic drug boom and dangerous doses, a true story of cops, counterfeiters and the contamination of America's drug supply. When we come back, we talked to one of the immigration attorneys arrested outside the California governor's mansion, calling on him to stop transferring people into immigrant jails where they can spread or catch COVID. And we'll speak to a hunger striker inside an ICE jail. And then what about that raid of a humanitarian camp on the Arizona-Mexico border? We'll go there. Stay with us. Confused by Porridge Radio. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. As the coronavirus spreads rapidly throughout the United States, we look at how the government continues to hold tens of thousands of asylum seekers and immigrants in detention centers and jails where social distancing is nearly impossible, ignoring the advice of medical experts and even the former head of ICE. Nearly one in five people detained by ICE in May and June were likely infected with COVID-19, according to a new analysis by the Vera Institute. That's about 15 times higher than the number of cases ICE has reported. At the same time, ICE has continued to deport people, including those who are infected, making it a global super spreader. How are people in ICE jails getting the virus? In some cases, they contract it from people ICE has transferred there. This was the focus of a protest at California Governor Gavin Newsom's mansion last week, when people chained themselves to his gate and demanded the immediate release of people in state prisons and immigration jails. This is Lisa Knox, attorney with the legal center Centro Legal de la Raza. Gavin Newsom, with the stroke of a pen, he could free folks. Yep. He could end this. This spread of COVID that's happening throughout our prisons, our jails, our detention centers, and throughout the world, thanks to ICE. But no, instead, he's complicit in all of this. Fourteen undocumented activists and immigration attorneys were arrested at Newsom's mansion. For more on what they're calling for, we're joined by one of them. Luis Angel Reyes Savasa is an immigration attorney, co-director of Pangea Legal Services in San Francisco. He is also undocumented. Welcome to Democracy Now! Luis Angel, it's great to have you with us. Explain why you got arrested and, I mean, the risks you yourself took as an undocumented person to make your point. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Um... Well, yeah, look, the, like you mentioned, the situation in ICE detention across the state um, and across the country, and really just the situation in prisons is really alarming. And here in California in particular, and like you'll be hearing from Joe Mejia, one of the hunger strikers, there's been an unprecedented hunger strike wave that has at this point um, encompassed every single detention center in California, where hunger strikers have demanded Governor Newsom to take action, specifically that he stopped transferring people who are being released, who are eligible for parole from state custody, where he has completely mishandled 
the pandemic where there's a spread of COVID-19 and stop transferring them over to ICE where this spreads the pandemic. And as you know, ICE has a long history of dehumanizing immigrants and of just a complete disregard for human, for human life and a complete disregard for providing basic access to medical care. And so for months since the pandemic started, there's been this growing push by people organizing in detention centers, demanding that the governor take action, especially when he speaks out saying that Black Lives Matter, that immigrant lives matter, but his actions have fallen quite short of that. Um, like, as you know, in Calif California had the first COVID-19 death. It didn't happen in Alabama. It didn't happen in Georgia. It happened right here in California under Governor Newsom's desk. And after we exhausted conventional channels of discussing with his office, we met with his office and his complete failure to act put us in a position where the lives of our clients and of our community members were at risk, that we felt compelled to take action and to bring their demands directly to the governor's door. And this is why we staged that civil disobedience action um, a week ago. And Luis Angel Reyes, what specifically are the governor's uh, powers in this situation? Uh, what are the limitations on it? And what could he do proactively uh, in terms of, um, of uh, the, the transfer of folks to, to uh, ICE detention? Yeah, so the hunger strikers and, you know, the, you know, the movement has been very clear about what the governor can do. Um, federal courts in California and across the country have found that ICE conditions are so gruesome, that they're so inhumane, that they're, they, they pose such a danger to life and to health, that, that detention under this pandemic is actually unconstitutional and have been ordering people's release. And a lot of our hunger strikers have been able to obtain release through these means. But even after these federal courts have ruled ICE detention essentially unconstitutional under this pandemic, Governor Newsom has continued to repopulate these detention centers by transferring people who, again, are eligible for parole, eligible for release from state custody and transferring them directly into ICE custody, um, essentially feeding now the largest exporter of COVID-19 across the world, um, which is ICE. Um, and so the demands have been very clear that the, the governor under state law has the authority to not cooperate with ICE, especially under these dire circumstances where it is life and death to stop transferring people released from state custody into ICE to stop populating the ICE detention centers. Um, he also has the authority to inspect these facilities. Um, he has the authority to inspect the deaths of, of Carlos Mejia, who died in Otay Mesa in San Diego. He hasn't inspected those facilities. There's just a complete lack of transparency from ICE, and we expect better from the governor. The governor also has um, the authority to um, utilize his clemency power to release as many people vulnerable from COVID-19 from state custody. And he has just completely um, ignored these demands. He's also failed to stop the expansion of ICE facilities in the state, despite a state law that prohibits private detention in California. So these very concrete demands about ending transfers, ending the expansion of ICE for-profit detention centers in California, as well as inspecting these facilities to hold ICE accountable and especially in inspect the facilities where COVID-19 deaths have taken place, and to use his clemency power is something that is clearly within his authority, and he has completely failed um, to act. And so we put, you know, our own health at risk by um, by risking arrest. And like you mentioned, myself being undocumented, um, yeah, definitely put myself at risk also of deportation. But when our clients and our community members are screaming on the top of their lungs and are taking really drastic action to to demand um, life under this pandemic and to not be forgotten, we felt that it was necessary to take these actions. And what we were met with um, after staging the civil disobedience at, uh, at the governor's mansion um, was uh, really shocking, right, that uh, Governor Newsom resorted to a lot of the tactics that oftentimes are attributed to the Trump administration, which was he resorted to the riot police and also a rare bail enhancement to make sure that the protesters were booked into jail, a jail in Sacramento that has had a COVID-19 outbreak. And really what this did was that it exposed us, it gave us a little glimpse of what our clients um, have been telling us for months, which is that you can't socially isolate, you can't physically distance in detention and in jails, and that the situation inside prisons is, is, is a tragedy waiting to happen. There's already been nearly 50 deaths in California, and you know this is on the governor's hands. Um, he needs to do more. Let me ask you about a colleague of yours, one of the people who was arrested, the immigration attorneys and activists outside the mansion. She had a fever. Can you explain what happened? Yeah, so we took many precautions before doing this, this action. We, we, we socially distanced during the protest. Um, we also got COVID tested before the protest. Um, but instead of the governor meeting with us, 
resorted to riot police, riot police who were not wearing protective gear, no face masks. Um, we were then arrested. We then learned that he utilized a bail enhancement to book us into jail, and this colleague, like you mentioned, um, tested uh, a temperature above 100 degrees and was asked to drink cold water and to drink ice water to lower that temperature. So instead of following the protocols that Governor Newsom every single week preaches on, on, on television, um, the state police, uh, you know, the Sacramento jail guards um, didn't practice these basic protocols. And with the case of one of our colleagues, um, actually circumvented those protocols by having that individual drink um, cold water. And then inside the jails, you know, the, the, the squalid cells, the grimy cells, just no hygiene, no soap no social distancing. There was one colleague, you know, several colleagues who were denied food through these 16 hours, um, were denied water, so they were dehydrated. One colleague um, actually was vomiting from dehydration, asked for medical assistance, and was denied basic medical care. And so, again, these really tragic stories that we're hearing from our clients in, in detention um, were all too real when, when, when we experienced this firsthand. And again, only for a period of 16 hours. Um, and our clients have been in detention, like you'll hear from Joe, for months, um, oftentimes years. Yes, we are going to go to Joe right now. I want to thank you, Luis Angel Reyes Savalza, uh, immigration attorney, co-director of Pangea Legal Services in San Francisco, undocumented yourself, and yet you risk that arrest outside California Governor Newsom's mansion while participating in the peaceful protest calling for the release of people from ICE prisons amidst the pandemic. Well, yes, many ICE jails are facing repeated work strikes and hunger strikes and other types of protests over the lack of access to personal protective equipment or quality medical care. For more, we are joined um, by in uh, Salinas, California, Salinas, California, by Joe Mejia, an asylum seeker who helped lead a hunger strike at the Yuba County Jail, where he was held by ICE for nearly 11 months, just released last week. Joe, welcome to Democracy Now! Um, talk about the conditions within the Yuba County Jail. How many detained immigrants were there? You had been transferred from a prison where you'd served full-time to this jail. How did you—what uh, happened inside? Yes. So, uh, I paroled in 2017, in October, and uh, immediately uh, at uh, R&R, which is the, uh, the booking and receiving end of, of prison, where they book you in and, and transfer you out, uh, ICE was there uh, to pick me up as soon as I was released, and uh, they took me to my first detention facility. Uh, which was an Elk Grove, which is now closed because the contract had ended. And since then, I have been uh, bounced around uh, to, to two more detention facilities after that, which I landed in uh, Yuba County Jail about August of last year. And uh, it, th that place is dangerous. It is, uh, it is a death sentence to, to uh, detainees, especially right now with the coronavirus. Um, medical attention is, 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 uh, is very poor at best. Uh, the conditions there are, are, are filthy. Um, the staff are very aware of, 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 of the dangers and, and, and the dire situation that they have us all in. And uh, they just don't care. They, they, they don't care about our safety. They don't care uh, about our well-being. And it's, it's clear in, in, in the way they treat us and in the uh, uh, um, uh, hygiene kits and, and, and the food and the water that they provide us, they, 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 it's a clear uh, signal of, of their, their poor treatment and uh, n uh, negligence towards us. And, uh, yeah, li like you mentioned, I, I helped lead a hunger strike about uh, two weeks ago. And uh, thankfully, uh, you know, I was blessed and I was released last Tuesday uh, thanks to this uh, COVID-19 bond, which they're calling it in there. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's basically a death sentence. Anybody getting picked up from prison or getting picked up from the streets and going into a detention center, is, it's basically a death sentence right now. It's, it's, they're playing Russian roulette with our lives. Uh, people are getting infected. Uh, Mesa Verde, Ote, San Diego. Uh, I mean, there's, there's infections right now as we speak in Bakersfield. And these facilities know what's going on. Gavin Newsom knows it's going on. And yet he's doing nothing to, to prevent it, to stop it from further spreading. Uh, they're actually delivering, hand-delivering coronavirus to all these other countries when they're deporting them. Uh, India, uh, Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, uh, all these countries, they, they know they have infected people and they continue to deport them into these countries that have uh, little to no resources to, to combat uh, COVID-19. So, you know, uh, anybody can see that they're one of the main uh, contributors to the spreading of coronavirus uh, worldwide. 
and yet they're doing nothing to to prevent it or or stop it from continuing to spread. And I feel Gavin Joe, Newsom has. Yes, sir. To Joe Mejia, I wanted to ask you what was the response of the of the uh, the guards within the detention center as you began organizing the uh, the hunger strike. Uh, was there any uh, attempts at retaliation before you were released? Yes. Yes. So. Uh, they always retaliate even before the hunger strike. It's uh, it, this facility is ran by sheriffs. It's a county jail, so their tactics are are intimidation and retaliation always. So when we did the hunger strike, uh, they pepper sprayed some of the detainees. They isolated them in what they call cold rooms or cool out rooms with no beds, uh, you know, no no entertainment, no phones, no nothing. It's just a toilet in a big rubber room, and they had them there. Uh, with the threat of if you're not going to eat, you're going to remain here until you eat. So, uh, you know, through through these tactics and, and psychological warfare, they try to scare us from uh, practicing our First Amendment right of freedom of speech and, and uh, protest, peaceful protest. Uh, at no time did any of these detainees attack these officers or were aggressive towards them, but yet these officers clearly attacked, handcuffed, uh, manhandled these detainees, pepper sprayed them, and uh, held them in these cold rooms until they, they until they ate. Uh, so it's, I mean, this is just, it's been going Did on for years. Did you have access to masks and protective gear? Sure, they give us masks, but they did not provide them for us. Uh, local organizations provided us with uh, handmade masks. And uh, so, you know, they always twist things around and they always find a way to punish us for, for uh, any type of thing like this. So they made a rule where if we hand wash these masks, we'll get written up or we'll get disciplined for it. If, uh, you know, just little things like that. But yet they can't provide us with clean masks. They just give us that one mask. And uh, the laundry there is very bad. Everything that comes back from laundry smells like urine. It's always stained. Um, so everyone's scared to send these masks off to laundry because they know it's going to come back smelling worse than what they were sent off. Is by. the hunger strike continuing there, Joe? As far as I know, no, but I know they're planning to uh, do a second wave of hunger strike because they have done nothing to, to accommodate uh, our dire situation with the coronavirus. As a matter of fact, I brought a hygiene kit with me from Yuba County Jail. Uh, so if you're indigent, this is what you're supposed to clean your entire body with. This is the bar of soap that they expect a grown man to clean their body with. So if you have no money at Yuba County Jail, you, you're basically going to starve and you're basically going to have very poor hygiene. And those are one of the things that we are demanding from, from ICE and Yuba County Jail, that they give us basic care, basic necessities, things that any basic human deserves, like shoes. They don't even give us shoes when we go into Yuba. Uh, we don't get Q-tips. We don't get deodorant. We don't get lotion. We don't get any of that. So those are some of the things that, that uh, they are demanding uh, from you, Ben, from ICE. Joe, we're going to have to cut you off, but I thank you so much for being such an important voice. Now outside, you were inside. Um, and I, uh, Joe Mejia is asylum seeker, recently released from Yuba County Jail, where he was held by ICE for nearly 11 months. Um, we, when we come back, we find out what happened on the Arizona-Mexico border with the raid. Stay with us. Ali Farcature and Tumani Diabate. This is Democracy Now!, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez as we end today's show in Arizona, where heavily armed Border Patrol officers raided a medical camp of humanitarian group No More Deaths Friday, detained 30 migrants whose whereabouts are still unknown. It was the second raid in just two days on the camp, which provides water, food and medical attention to refugees crossing into the United States through the scorching Sonoran Desert. The raids carried out by the Border Patrol's Bort 
attack teams. The same militarized special operation units recently deployed to suppress protests in Portland, Oregon. They came after No More Deaths published documents revealing the Border Patrol Union, a pro-Trump and anti-immigrant extremist group, had instigated a 2017 raid of the same camp. For more, we go to Tucson and are joined by Montana Thames, one of the humanitarian aid workers with No More Deaths. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Montana. What happened last Friday? Um, sorry, we don't hear you, Montana. We're trying to bring Hi. up your audio. Go ahead. Hi, Amy. Can you hear me now? We can, yes. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, but like you said, it was a military-style raid that happened on Friday. Um, they had been surveilling 24-7 surveillance um, since Thursday morning on the camp. Uh, they had about 24 Border Patrol agent trucks come in. Uh, there was a helicopter 200 feet above the camp. Um, they had a Bortac Bearcat tank enter the camp um, alongside Bortac agents with huge assault rifles um, walking into the camp. They were the first wave to neutralize any threat. Um, but there was ATVs, drones, the whole shebang came out uh, to neutralize this big threat. But immediately after they entered the camp, the first thing they did was round up all of the No More Deaths um, aid workers and zip tied them, remove their phones. It was very clear they didn't want any witnesses for um, what they were about to do next. Uh, the aid workers were able to overhear from the Border Patrol um, radios that there was chasing of migrants happening around them. Um, they described the accounts they were hearing on the radios as violent um, and scary. And Border Patrol, after they seized 30-plus migrants that were seeking um, food and medical attention, they proceeded to completely trash the camp. Um, they slashed all of our tents. They slashed people's personal tents. Um, they overturned anything that we had. Uh, they slashed open cots, a complete ransack of the place. Um, they took all of our medical records and all of our um, phones that were in the office and on volunteers uh, for evidence. They um, disconnected the only water source that the camp has, um, which volunteers found later. They did all this in a flash. They didn't show any warrant at first. Um, and when they did show the warrant, the one thing that volunteers noticed was that on the warrant, under items to be seized, um, it said illegal uh, aliens, so meaning migrants. And so it just showed that they viewed the migrants as objects to be seized from the premises, um, and it just, like, further proves their justification of dehumanizing uh, migrants to justify their violence. And, Montana, we only have about a, a minute left, but if you could talk about th this whole issue of them raiding you just after you released a, a, a report uh, similar to what happened back in 2017, when a raid happened after you released the report. Yeah, so in 2017, we released the Disappear Part 2, and about four hours later, um, Dr. Scott Warren was apprehended. This time, this was less than 24 hours, so we released this report, um, or these documents, on Wednesday at about 11 a.m., and the first time they entered camp without a warrant was on Thursday around 8 or 9 a.m., so less than 24 hours later, they— um, started their intimidation tactics and surveillance. And this was Bortac, the same unit, um, the kind, the same group that has been going after Black Lives Matter in places like Portland, Oregon? We have five seconds. Yes. Yes. yes it was Bortac.
Well, I want to thank you so much, Montana Thames, for joining us, humanitarian aid worker with No More Deaths. And we'll continue to show what happens there. And people can go to our website at democracynow.org to get our interviews with uh, Scott Warren uh, after he was arrested. Uh, that does it for our show. Democracy Now! is produced with Renee Feltz, Mike Burke, Dina, Dina Guzder, Libby Rainey, Nermeen Sheikh, Maria Tarasena, Carla Wills, Tammy Warnoff, Tarina Nadura, Sam Alcoff, Tamaria Studio, yeah. John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, I'm Amy Goodman oh, with you. one. Gonzalez. Stay safe, save lives.